a long time ago, back in another dispensation of time, when I was uh, uh, going to Bible school, uh, when we were down in Griffin, uh, we had a pastor's special day uh, there at Emmanuel Bible College where pastors could go from 7 in the morning until 10.30 in the evening, one day a week. So uh, a pretty long day. And uh, on those days, uh, of course, driving home from uh, Peachtree City, first of all from Atlanta, uh, and then from Peachtree City, uh, 10, after 10.30 at night, was kind of quiet, and I had the radio station on, and uh, there was a... Uh, a big station up north. I, I, I want to say WCKY. Does that sound right, Brother Tom? Uh, I, I can't remember. Any, anyway, there was a primitive Baptist church had a program on at night. And they had a choir. Because if you know anything at all about primitive Baptist churches, they don't have music in the church. They, they don't have pianos, organs, guitars, anything like that in the church. They're, they're, and music, they're much like Church of Christ, Camelites are. But uh, man, they had a choir that, that, that sang, and they sang that song, How Firm a Foundation. Just bless my soul, Brother Roger. Uh, coming home, just knowing that the God I serve is a foundation that's firm, and I can rest on that and, and never have to tremble. Well, we're moving ahead in the book of Psalms. Now, we should move quickly here for a while. Because we finished up Psalms 119. If you've got your Bible open tonight or if you want to turn and look, and I hope you will, we're going to go to Psalms 120 in just a moment. And we'll be reading the seven verses that are there. It's interesting. I, I thought how interesting as I was studying this week how the Psalms vary in length. We just finished up a, a Psalm of 176 verses. We've come to a Psalm of seven verses. Uh, if you look, you'll find uh, psal uh, psalms with uh, 40 verses, psalms with 25 verses. Uh, they, they, they are varied in their length. And I, I got to thinking about that. I, I suppose the Lord, knowing us as he knows us, uh, knowing that, that we are who we are and we are as we are, we're never satisfied is if everything is the same all the time. We, we, can, go to, we can go to Chick fil A and, 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 and get a chicken sandwich, and it's wonderful today. And then tomorrow, we say, Well, I don't, I don't want to go there. I'm tired. I'm tired of chicken sandwiches. Uh, or, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we go to the ice cream store and, and we can get a, we, we can get a, a, a vanilla, vanilla bean ice cream and, and it's always oh, just a wonderful day. And, and we do that a couple of times. Well, I don't want that today. We, we, the Lord knew that being who we are and, and as we are, that uh, we'd not be particularly satisfied if, if everything were the same all the time. And so, I thought about how he's given to us in the book of Psalms, long psalms and short psalms and medium-sized psalms, just like we have long days and short days, just like we have good days and, and bad days. I thought about how that it is a fact that all of life really is a series of changes. Would you agree with that? Life changes. Get ready for it. If you haven't, if you haven't noticed it, get ready for it. If you, happen to, if you happen to see an individual that you haven't seen for several years and you meet them unexpectedly, sometimes it takes a little bit of thinking on our part to identify them. Why? Because the years and the toil of life brings about change in us. Now you... You may feel real satisfied with where you are. Somebody walks up to you. You hadn't seen them in four, five, six years. And, and, and they walk up to you and, and recognize you. And they say, oh, you haven't changed in the least. They're lying. They just lying. And, and, and so are you if you make that kind of statement. Because we all changed. We all change. There's no place in this life where time and life stand still. What a comforting truth 
It is to know that in the midst of all of our changes that we have a God who never changes. He never changes. He, he, he's never fickle about anything at all. You, you don't go to God today and he's in a good mood and go back tomorrow and he's in a bad mood. <laughs> you don't ever go to the Lord today and he wants to listen to you and tomorrow you go back and he doesn't want to listen to you. He never changes. I love that passage over in, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 that says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the only one who does not change. And by the way, just as, hear what I'm saying now, just as he is unchangeable, so the word of God never changes. God's word does not change from generation to generation. Part of the problem and part of the difficulty that we, we're, we're experiencing uh, in the church world today is that, 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 that uh, everybody wants to make Christianity a progressive thing. Changing our thinking on everything and, uh, change, and, and, and saying, well, uh, that, that, that portion of Scripture meant this to that generation. It doesn't mean that to us today. Well, I can tell you, just as God never changes, the Word of God does not change. There's a marvelous unity between the written Word and the living Word. And men may try to tear down the Word of God. They may try to rip it apart just as they've tried to find fault with the person of Jesus Christ. But just as our blessed Lord comes away from all those attacks with not even a bruise, so the Word of God prevails completely intact. And I can tell you tonight, when all this thing comes to an end, when, when, the, when God draws the curtain on time and time shall be no more, I can tell you the Word of God is still going to be intact. Let me give you a couple of things about the next 15 Psalms that we're going to be looking at. You'll notice uh, in your Bible, the, uh, in, the, in, in the, the, the subtitle uh, underneath the uh, uh, Psalm number here says that these are songs, a song of degrees. There are 15 of them in, in this section, a song of degrees. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what that means, but as I, as I studied this week trying to sift through those things, I, Dr. John Phillips uh, helped me to, to grasp what I believe is as good an understanding about what this means uh, as anybody that I looked at. He points out that these 15 Psalms correspond to the number of years that God added to the life of a man by the name of Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah was sick. God told him he's going to die. Prepare to meet thy God. And uh, he began to cry out to God. And uh, Dr. Phillips says there's only one set of degrees that are mentioned in the Bible. And that had to do with the sundial of Ahaz. And the Holy Spirit, if you go to the book of Isaiah, uh, through Isaiah gave Hezekiah a sign that he was going to add 15 years to his life. And that sign was uh, the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz being pushed back 10 degrees. It's very probable that Hezekiah wrote 10 of these Psalms. David wrote four of them, and Solomon wrote one of them. If you'll, if you'll look, uh, Solomon's uh, psalm is right in the center, uh, chapter 127. It's the, it's the middle psalm in these songs of degrees, and it's designated a song of degrees for Solomon. The others, uh, uh, outside of a couple, uh, do not tell us who the author was. David's... Uh, Four, uh, there are two of them in the, in, the, in the first group of seven, and there are two of them in the last group of seven. And so with that introduction, I want you to notice uh, our text verses this evening. Look at, look at Psalms 120, and that's, let's just read the verses, and then we'll come back and, and look at some thoughts around these verses tonight. The psalmist says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper? 
Woe is me that I sojourn in Mesech, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. I think uh, verse 7 here gives us a key to understanding what the psalmist is talking about in these verses. He is a peace-loving man who finds himself living in the midst of a warlike world. He he is a a God-loving man, a a man committed to God who is a peace-loving individual, and he finds himself in the midst of a warlike world. I I thought about that as I I was looking at that verse and, and the emphasis of what he's talking about here. And I thought, you know, the world has changed very little since the psalmist, whether it's it's Hezekiah, or whether it was someone else. The world has changed very little since he penned these words down. We are living in a warlike world today, whether it's nation against nation, individual against individual, or families against families today. Now and then, there is a moment, there's a place of peace, but in reality, the world we're living in is filled with strife to some degree. Uh, somebody said to me uh, just the other day, I, I've never seen a time when it seemed like people love drama as much as they love drama today. I've never seen a time when it, when it seemed like people wanted to, to vent their anger against somebody else. You probably saw the, the, the thing in the news about uh, the, the fellow being arrested right here in our city in, in Chattanooga. Uh, in, in a road rage incident because he pulled a, a gun out and pointed it at somebody. With just an anger-filled world today. And so in reality, things have not changed from the time the psalmist wrote these words to the day that we're living in. Let, let me call your attention to three things as we look at the words of the psalmist here. Notice in verse 1, his prayer, the prayer of the psalmist. Uh, three, uh, three things I, I see revealed in this first verse. First of all, his distress. L- look at the first words. In my distress. Now we could talk about Hezekiah's sickness. That was distress. We, we could talk about what he faced uh, uh, politically, what he faced as a, uh, as, as a leader of his nation that time when there was a threat of the Babylonians. But what I want you to notice here is something, this is something that applies to every one of us. The plight of the psalmist here is one that is common to all men. In fact, the Bible tells us in Job chapter 14 and verse 1, Job said, man, this born of, of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He emphasizes two important facts in that verse. First of all, he emphasizes the brevity of life. Man is of few days. And in verse 5 of that chapter, he says, Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. My days are determined. Your days are determined. Now, I will tell you very quickly tonight, you and I can hasten our deaths. Or you and I can... can uh, We can uh, nurture our bodies like we ought to and take care of our bodies like we ought to and uh, add uh, some amount of years. But I can tell you tonight, the Word of God teaches us that God has determined the days that we're going to live. And and somebody said, boy, I wish I could live to be 70. When I I can remember back in, uh, in 1950, in school, Hearing them talk in school about the year 2000, I thought, my soul, that's the way I joke. And then, then somebody said in the year 2020, and I thought, well, I'll never see 2020. And where are we? 2021. And how quickly did we get here? Just like that. Justin and Savannah sitting here, the youngest people in this room tonight, uh, outside of the grandchildren uh, of uh, the Brewers, Now, I'm going to tell you they're going to turn around about two or three times and they're going to find themselves with gray hair 
or falling hair, one of the two. Life is brief. I, I mean, you, you say, that's discouraging, preacher. No, I, I'm telling you tonight, you better make much of the life that God's given you because it's short. And you better, you better not be wasting the, the time that God has given you because it is a brief amount of time. Don't, don't throw away, don't, don't be a poor steward of the life that God has given to you. So he emphasizes the brevity of life, but he also emphasizes the common, commonality of trouble that we all share. Man is a few days and full of trouble. Thank the Lord for peaceful days. Thank the Lord for restful days. But oh, how quickly those troublesome days can come. A visit to the doctor's office. A phone call in the middle of the night. A sudden severe pain. All those things are common to the troublesome pathway of man through this world. The psalmist was experiencing something common to all men. Thank God for the second part of this verse. Notice not only the distress of the psalmist, but his desire. He said, I cried unto the Lord. What a blessing to be able to cry unto the Lord. Somebody said, uh, bruises only become blessings when they drive us to the Lord. How sad it is that that, that trouble will come in the lives of people that God is trying to use uh, to, to awaken them to their need of Him and they, 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 they let those things come and go without ever turning to God in the, fit, in the midst of it. I want to say thank God for the place of prayer tonight that you and I can come to in our times of distress. I could use a number of verses, uh, but the one that came to mind as I studied was Luke 18, verse 1, where Jesus said, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. So many times I've said this over the years from this pulpit, time and again, prayer is to the spiritual life what air is to the physical life. If you don't pray, spiritually the same thing is going to happen to you if you get your oxygen cut off. The cure for fainting spells in life is a good old-fashioned prayer closet calling on God, asking Him for help. Not only I see the distress of the psalmist and his desire, but I see his deliverance. Look at the last part of the verse. And he heard me. Notice the, the tenses of the two verbs here. The word cried and the word heard. Those are past tense verbs. And what the psalmist is doing here, he is drawing in, uh, from the past encouragement for the present. He's looking back in his life at how God has blessed in days past. How, how God, how, how, how he's prayed and how God has heard and, and, and how God has answered those prayers. And what he's doing, literally he's encouraging himself with, with what God has done uh, to understand that God can still do the same thing. Past answers are always an encouragement for present appeals. James 5 verse 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Psalms 91, 19, He shall call upon me and I will answer and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. So we see first of all the prayer of the psalmist. But then notice secondly the problem of the psalmist. And he details that for us in verses 2 through 6. And I see three things that, that he talks about in these verses. First of all, the contempt that he's facing. L look at verse number 2. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What he's saying to us here is that the cause of his problems is lying lips and deceitful tongues. Brother Spurgeon said, lips are soft, but when they are lying lips, they suck away the life of character and are as murderous as razors. Venomous snakes are dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, somebody was telling me this week about the warning that uh, they're giving everybody in, in, our, in our part of the country right now about copperheads. 
with all these cicadas that are, that are, that are coming out and, uh, and uh, they are food for the copperhead snake and they're everywhere. And uh, they're dangerous, very dangerous. Well, they're dangerous. Somebody said, I, I don't like rattlesnakes. Well, I don't either, but I, I, I'd rather be confronted with a rattlesnake than a copperhead because a rattlesnake at least sound is rather, you hear that before, you, before, you, before he does anything. The copperhead just simply bites. But I will tell you, as dangerous as a poisonous snake is, it's not as dangerous and deadly as lying lips. Those who tell lies, you, you, you can protect yourself uh, against an attack from somebody with a weapon of whatever sort, but, 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 but there, is, there is no shield against a lying tongue. You say, how do you know that? Because I've experienced it. I have been down that road. Somebody said an unbridled tongue is a chariot of the devil wherein he rides in triumph. Someone else said about the tongue, it's a little piece of flesh, small in quantity, but mighty in, in, small in quantity, but mighty in quality. It is soft, but slippery. It goes lightly, but falls heavily. It strikes softly, but wounds sorely. It goes out quickly, but burns vehemently. It pierces deeply and therefore heals slowly. And once it is inflamed with Satan's bellows, it's like the fire of hell itself. It's no wonder the Apostle James had this to say about the tongue. He said, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter is a little, a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. James 3, 5 and 6. Been more trouble caused in this world by the tongue than by the mightiest of weapons that our militaries hold in hand. Here I am at, uh, at a point where I've been pastoring almost 45 years, and the problems that I've been encountered with in church. I, th I thought about it while I was sitting studying today. The, the problems I've encountered in church, I cannot name one. Not, I could not name one that did not start with somebody's tongue. Somebody either saying something they ought not to have said or somebody telling a lie and then being unwilling to confess it. And even, even when people are willing to confess it, oftentimes there's no healing of the hurt that's there. Dr. Wearsby said he's convinced that most of the problems in families and churches are caused by professing Christians who do not have a real and vital relationship to Jesus Christ. They're not humble peacemakers, but arrogant troublemakers. Until God changes them or they decide to go elsewhere, the dedicated believers must be patient and prayerful. How did, how did Joseph deal with his brothers in Canaan? He dealt with it patiently. How, how did he deal with his false accusers in Egypt when he was taken there? Patiently, waiting. Have you ever had to deal with lying lips and deceitful tongues? Well, he said, surely as a preacher, you've never had to deal with that. You'd be surprised. Oh, my. I, listen, I, I hadn't even gotten out of the gate good as a preacher until I had to deal with it. I had an older fella that had been in the church, not here, but, and I won't even say where else. You know where, the only other place I've ever pastored, but, but it was there. And that older, older fella was teaching a, Sunday, a men's Sunday school class. They were struggling financially. They, they, couldn't even pay, they couldn't even pay the power bill and the water bill. They said, we don't be able to pay your salary this week. And so I decided, with the help of the Lord, it's time for the preacher to preach on tithing, Brother Tom. He, he need a good series on what the Word of God says about stewardship. Well, it made that old man so mad. He couldn't wait till the next Sunday morning to get up in Sunday school class and tell that group of men what a liar I was. And I had no Bible. I, all I was preaching was Old Testament stuff. 
that was under the law and we was under grace. Well, thankfully, I had a spy. Everybody needs a spy, somebody in confidence. He came to me and said, you know what the problem is? You know about it? I said, well, I thought I sort of thought. I did. I'm still in that series on tithing, and I preached again that Sunday morning. He came out of the church that Sunday morning, and he was steaming out of both ears. He said, you, you, you're preaching untruth to these people. I said, this is not the place, and this is not the time for us to discuss this. You go into the car, and we'll talk about it. He came back that Sunday night, and I said, we're going to have lunch tomorrow. Well, all right. And I met him for lunch, and he sat down, and here he went. He's, I said, whoa, wait a minute. I said, now, I'm 33 years old, and you're in your mid-70s, and my daddy taught me to respect older men, and I respect you. But you are as wrong as you can be. I said, now, you've got two choices, and these are it. You got two choices. You can either submit to the authority of the pastor and the preaching of God's word, or you can resign your Sunday school class. He resigned his Sunday school class and left. Lying lips. You said he caused any problems? Oh, yeah, he caused some problems. But sometimes you have to deal with lying lips. Notice not only the contempt he faced, but the condemna condemnation he desired. Boy, verses 3 and 4, this is Old Testament praying. Understand that now. I, I, I would not tell you this is the kind of praying that Christians in this day and time ought, ought to pray. But I can tell you that, that what you read here is Bible truth. That God will deal with the wicked. Look at what he says. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? And then he answers the question. Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. I, again, I like what Brother Spurgeon said about these verses. He says the psalmist is not praying for revenge simply because there's no way humanly to repay somebody who's guilty of the viciousness and hurtfulness of lying lips and a deceitful tongue. And, and, and he said people who are like that, you don't have any recourse against them because, but because they are, it, it's, it's kind of like trying to deal with a foul odor of a skunk. You, you can't deal with the stink of a skunk. <laughs> you can spray whatever you want to spray. <laughs> you, 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 can get, you can get your wife's perfume or whatever, and it won't deal with the stink of a skunk. That's my wife. She's got a wonderful story about her and her mother getting up, getting a powder, powder puff sitting on the porch when a skunk got under their house. You, you've got to hear the story. Ask her about it. His plea is to God who tells us in his word, vengeance belongs to me and I will repay. Romans 12, 19. In verse 4, he tells us that their judgment will, will be like that of a keen, sharp arrow. He's talking about an arrow that, that has had a fine, keen point put on it. And, and then that arrow has been placed in the coals of the juniper. Now, the, 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 the word juniper here, uh, comes from the Hebrew word for broom. There was a broom plant in, in, uh, uh, in, in that part of the world. And even today, the Arabs take that broom plant and they make charcoal, some of the finest charcoal you'll find in the world. And, and the reason it, 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 is, uh, uh, it, it is so good is because it holds its heat. Uh, you can build a fire and it get come down to charcoals and it may look cold on the top, but it'll hold its heat for days and days and days. And even today, the Arabs make charcoal out of this. And he's talking about taking that sharp, keen arrow, and that's bad enough being shot with that, but heating it up to, to, a, to an intense heat and then shooting that arrow into that one who has a lying tongue. Well, what does the Bible tell us about liars? All liars, the Bible says, will have their portion of the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Their worm dieth not, and their fire is not quenched. Do you understand what he's telling us here? He's telling us it's better to be the victim of lying tongues, lying lips and, and deceitful tongues than it is to be the author of those things. But then he talks about the condition he lives in in verses, uh, verses 5 and 6. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach. Now that's, on, that's in the northern part of the country. 
that I dwell in the tents of Kedar, and that's in the far southern part of the country. He couldn't have lived in both those places. So, so what he's doing, he's using an illustration here to get a point across to us. Mesech was the son of Japheth. And, and the name here signifies the descendants who occupied the extreme north of Palestine. Kedar was the son of Ishmael. And the name again signifies his descendants who, who occupied the extreme south of Palestine. And the reason the psalmist is using these, these two nations is because of their fierce warlike attitudes. They, they were fierce people. And by the way, they still are fierce people. They're like what we're seeing going on. Somebody said, I don't understand why these Palestinians, they know Israel is going to respond to what they're doing, shooting those rockets over there. They know they're going to have people get killed. They don't care if people get killed. They, they really don't have any respect for human life whatsoever. I understand it's hard for us to realize that living uh, in, in America where we've had the truth of God's word given to us. The picture here is of anger and viciousness in our world. And, and what a picture of the day that we're living in. And the psalmist was appalled by their sin. He said, uh, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. He, he, he's sick to his soul. All that reminds us of, of where we are today and the frustration that we, we find ourselves dealing with in the face of what's going on in our world today. The viciousness and the anger of our world. I read, I read this afternoon that the Secretary of State has authorized all of our embassies around the world to fly the Black Lives Matter flag over our U.S. embassies. And this Black Lives Matter crowd, they're part of, of, of this socialist agenda in this country, dividing and ripping our nation apart. The psalmist was unhappy because he lived among those with whom he had no spiritual fellowship at all. And that's always the case with those who love the Lord. A peace-loving man in a warlike world. Last of all, we see his passion in verse number 7. I am for peace, but when I speak, they're for war. And we see two attitudes expressed here. First of all, there's the attitude of the peace-hater. I don't believe any, any sane Christian would love war. Anybody, anybody that's been around any of that is going to have no love for war. In fact, the child of God is going to hate war because of the suffering that it brings. But that being said, I, I have to tell you tonight, I, I don't understand how any Christian can align themselves today with some of the foolish pacifism that seems to be so prevalent in this time. We see it in the attitude of those who advocate a, a principle or a policy between nations that, that uh, not only is contrary to the Bible, but uh, in many cases absolutely absurd. We, we, we've, heard it, we've heard it from this liberal side of, of, uh, of politics in our country with this thing that's going on between Israel and the Palestine and, and the hatred for Israel. And, and uh, their, their, their thinking is totally absurd. It has to be demonic. There's no other way to explain it. And, 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 the, and the, the terrible thing is they, they try to pass it off as Christianity. We, li we live in America with this crowd today that wants to do away with our laws. They, they want to do, do away with our police force, those who enforce the laws. And by the way, their goal, their, their overall goal is to destroy our form of government through divisiveness between our people so that they can ultimately overthrow our form of government, destroy our constitution, and as I've said over and over again, establish socialism as the ruling thing in America. It's not going to get better. I wish I could tell you that 
two years from now, or about a year and a half from now, we're going to have another election and it's going to change things, but it's not going to get any better, folks, as far as this world is concerned. Why? Because in, in the unregenerate heart of man, there, there, there lies dormant. The, the, all the impulses of crime and, and hatred and violence and rebellion it is there, and, and without law and without law enforcement, the, those things go on the rampage. The human heart has not changed apart from the grace of God and the working of the Holy Spirit of God in the hearts and lives of men who trust the, Jesus, trust the Lord Jesus Christ. The heart of man it has not changed. It's still an enmity with God, only a heart that's been changed by the grace of God is capable of, of maintaining peace. Not only do we see the attitude of the peace hater, but we see the attitude of the peace lover. The psalmist says, I am for peace. I am for peace. And there are so many verses in the New Testament that admonish the Christian to live in peace with his fellow man. 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lip that, lips that speak no guile, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Let him seek peace. Hebrews 12 and verse 4, Follow peace with all men. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15, God hath called us to peace. But then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, Paul says, If it be possible, as much as life in you, Live peaceable with all men. It is God's desire that we live in peace. Now, listen, there are people that will not let you live in peace with them. They, it is just the point of their life to cause turmoil. But it ought to be the desire of our hearts on a consistent basis to be peacemakers in our world. Let me close by reminding you that there's something far more important than peace among nations or peace among individuals, and that's peace with God. You don't have peace with God. I can tell you, no matter what else, there's going to be trouble. And the fact is, when a man's at peace with God, he's going to be at peace with his neighbor. I've always said, I've always said, if a man loves God and he's in a right relationship with the Lord, he's going to be at peace with others. The sad thing is that there are those who will take advantage of that. But I can tell you as God's people, we're going to come out on the winning side of this thing. I can tell you the author of peace is coming again soon. And when he comes as Prince of Peace, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Prince of Peace, there will be peace. Won't we need peace till he comes again. Our only, our only outlet in the midst of all that we're facing today is to do what the psalmist did and cry unto the Lord and bring our burdens and needs to Him. Bow your head with me for a minute. A peace-loving man in a warlike world. People face it in jobs. People face it in families. It even, it, it, it's even faced in churches. But thank the Lord tonight we can be at peace with God. And we can find peace in our own hearts as we walk hand in hand with him. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Bless these moments now. And I, I pray that as all over this room folks are praying, Lord, I, I know we live in, an, uh, in such an unperfect world. Uh, we've seen, I've seen it in my family. I, I've seen odds, uh, family members, brothers and sisters at odds, parents and children at odds. Oh, Lord, that's such a terrible thing. I, I've seen it in churches where uh, people who ought, to, ought not to be living in such a way would let things rise up and become so, uh, so anger-filled that, that, that there was not a peaceful atmosphere. Oh, God, help us in these hours to allow the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. And even in these moments, Lord, I pray you'd help folks as they pray about special burdens in their own lives and in their families. Thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Why must Janet play softly? God's spoken to your heart. You pray tonight.